Hi, Noreen. How are you? Hi. Okay, how are you doing? Oh, good. Good, thanks. Don't we have to get together sometime before you leave? Let's oh, get together yeah, again. Oh, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, like I said, I am the uh, end of June. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much, Noreen, for that nice, uh, very nice introduction. And it's a real pleasure to have this opportunity to present uh, some of uh, my work on conditional uh, cash transfer program. This is a, a new project. Uh, with Tom Vogel uh, here in economics uh, at uh, here at Princeton. Okay, so uh, let me start talking a bit about uh, history of conditional cash transfer programs. It's really striking the extent to which these programs have become a main strategy for poverty of alleviation around uh, the developing world. So they're now uh, conditional cash transfer programs, or CCTs, in over 60 countries uh, around the world. They began in Latin America and Mexico, which I'm going to talk about today, and Brazil. They're all over Latin America. Almost every country has a conditional cash uh, transfer program. And now they've also spread to develop, uh, developing countries in Africa and Asia. There are even a few programs now uh, in Europe and a couple of pilot uh, programs of CCTs underway in the US, in New York, uh, and uh, Memphis. So why so much you know, attention? Why are these programs suddenly so, so popular? What's their main uh, innovation? So these are programs. They're poverty alleviation programs. So they give money uh, to the poor. Um, but they condition, as the name <laughs> suggests, they condition uh, transfers uh, to the poor, to their investment in human capital. And so uh, what does this mean in exchange for receiving uh, transfers? Our poor households uh, are obligated to send uh, their kids to school. Some countries also have a health component, uh, which so there's a part of the transfers that are linked to uh, uh, attending a preventative uh, health uh, clinic visits. Okay, so if they don't comply with those conditions, they don't receive the money uh, in that month. So what's attractive about this? And so their programs, that in a sense, have two, uh, two objectives, uh, two big objectives within one, uh, one program. So on the one hand, they give uh, money to the poor today. So they have the objective of uh, reducing poverty uh, today. You know, so families have more money today. They can buy uh, more food, et cetera. But it also has this interesting second objective, which is reducing poverty in the future, so breaking or helping to break you know, the intergenerational transmission of poverty. So the idea is since you condition the benefits, kids will be more likely to go to school, they'll get more schooling, and so when they grow up, the idea is they'll be uh, more likely to have uh, better jobs. And it's really the second, uh, this kind of second objective that's what's gotten a lot of attention on this idea of uh, kind of having uh, two objectives within one, within one program. Okay, so the question of uh, the talk today is, so we're going to look at a context of a conditional cash transfer that's been around for a while. So now we have a generation of kids who basically grew up uh, with this program, and so we want to look at the second objective. So is it true that kids that got uh, more schooling as a result of a conditional cash transfer are more likely to get better jobs when they enter the labor market or to have uh, higher incomes? And so that's the uh, the question of today, that might seem, you know, we often find in studies that people with higher education have uh, higher wages, so that might not seem surprising. But this is a context where we'll see the communities where the uh, CCP is uh, received are very poor. They're very agriculturally uh, oriented. Uh, that's most of what there is to do in these communities. It's agriculture, the schools are uh, not, uh, not very good. And so you might think that, uh, and a lot of critics of the program have been saying this, for a long time, that what might happen is, okay, sure, you get the kids in school uh, for more time or more years, but when they grow up, they're not going to have higher higher okay, so They're just spending more time in school, but not necessarily uh, learning more or doing anything uh, very, uh, very productive. And actually, there's some evidence that supports a bit uh, this worry, uh, so that a number of short-term CCT studies of schooling impact show that it's, you know, it's true that kids spend more time in school, but the impacts on learning are kind of mixed. So, you know, that seems, that's a bit strange. You know, if you spend more time in school, you should be learning more. So, uh, so that, uh, that's kind of a bit of a, of a red flag. And so there's, there's one other paper I'll mention in the literature review. This is really one of the, the first papers to look 
at uh, the sort of longer term uh, labor market effects on uh, youth have grown up uh, with a, a CCT program. Okay, so this paper then will look at income employment effects of the oldest conditional cash transfer program. I'll say more about uh, Progressa in a minute. Uh, began in 1997. So I'm only going to talk about effects in rural areas. The program operates also in urban areas, but that's a later, uh, later phase of expansion. So I'm only going to talk about effects of rural youth in poor areas. So the treatment group, the kids I'm really going to focus on, are those who are age 11 to 12 pre program in 1997. So that'll be you know, my, my treatment group, uh, so to speak. Why, um, why that age group? And this is because these youth are when the program starts. They're right in the transition, the age to transition between primary and secondary school. And what short term effects have shown of the program. That's really where you get a big education effect on those groups of kids. You know, the programs are false from the sky, you know, gives them a scholarship for going to school right at the right time, and so that's a big effect. If you get offered that same scholarship several years later, it's really too late. You've already dropped out and you're not going to go back to school to be with a bunch of, of 12 girls. Right, so that'll be the, the group of interest, and so I'm going to follow them uh, in, in a sense. And so by the long-term effects, I'm going to look at when these same kids were 11 to 12 when the program started, They'll be 24 to 25 in 2010, which is when I'll last look at them. And so at that point, I can see what's happened to their outcomes in the labor market. And I'll also show that they do, in fact, have uh, achieved more schooling. The data is the 10% sample of the Mexican census from 1990, 2000, and 2010. So I link this information to administrative beneficiary information, which tells me how many beneficiaries uh, there are a Progressa at the municipality level. So I'll use the 1990 to look at pre-program trends, that's before the program begins. I'll use the 2000 to look at short-term effects after three years of the program. And I'll use 2010 to look at the longer term effects. Okay, the identification, what's the strategy? Um, it's a simple difference in difference. So I'll be comparing so the two variations are uh, in municipalities, so basically in 2010, all the rural municipalities have, uh, have a CCT, and if you visit any rural community, almost surely they'll have uh, half of the households at least will have the program. So the variation here is going to come from municipalities that get the program earlier versus municipalities that get the program later. And the other difference, oh, whoops, sorry. the other difference is uh, from a youth who are right at this age, the right age to receive. Uh, the benefit. So these are youth that were 11 to 12. And so I'm going to compare them to youth that are just a little bit older. So 14 and 15 when it's really the offer of this grant is just too, too late for it to benefit much, uh, for them to benefit much from school. So Sorry. You, yeah. But they, do they, they're possibly, their families might be benefiting through the transfer from younger siblings though, right? That's correct. That's correct. So, you know, it's a program that does a lot of things. In a sense, it gives um, you know gives money, it conditions that money. Um, you know, the mom controls the money, so they're they're different. I'm going to assume that those effects are similar to by age. Okay, but the but that that'll match with even my earlier wonder was the effects uh, on labor market outcomes, just of the health and well-being of the family by having more money, but the older kids should difference or they. Some might difference that out, some might not. Or how are you distinguishing between the education per se effects and the effects of the transfer? Yeah, I'm not really. So in a sense, it's, uh, it's receiving a program early versus like, you know, highlighting the effect on education. But you're right, there may be other uh, effects. But if you're in rural Mexico, it's not going to be that great because the opportunities for going to school, they're just not that great in the rural areas. Um, for the older kids to go to secondary because many times they don't have the primaria right. and the secondary requires transportation, right. etc. So the, the spillover effect, the contamination effect on the older kids, it's going to be through having more to eat, but not necessarily going to school. Right, right. So, um, yeah, that's right. So, but I, that's right. Yeah, so the point that there could be labor market effects, and I'll assume those are similar or, um, by, by age. Mm. Okay, so I'll use the, you have the 1990, which is pre-programmed to test uh, the specification. 
And, um, and actually, you can also, and this uh, um, uh, gets, it, uh, gets a bit at the point, you can also use older individuals as a, you know, as a type of a control group in 2010. Because again, they shouldn't have effects on education. Actually, we looked at the labor uh, trends. And, um, and so that's, uh, that's uh, uh, important. OK. OK, so I'll just preview uh, the, the results. Um, so we find a large employment and income effects uh, for men. So an overall increase, uh, what's the education increase? Uh, 0.7 uh, grades of schooling. So that's about a 10% uh, increase uh, for men. Uh, the increase in labor force participation is about 4%. It's a pretty large increase in labor income, 35%. Uh, percent. We see shifts away from agricultural work towards non-agricultural options. Uh, for women, in fact, the schooling increases are even larger, um, but we don't see uh, significant effects on employment or, or income uh, for women. Okay, so let me talk a little about, give a little more details of what, uh, what the program does. Um, so, uh, so Progressa gives uh, monetary transfers uh, to poor families conditional on human capital investment. So in, how does that work operationally? So uh, transfers are given monthly. Uh, they're linked to, so kids need to be enrolled, and they need to attend 85% of the time. Otherwise, the family won't receive uh, the transfer in that month. So there's also a transfer that's conditioned to regular uh, preventative health clinic visits. Um, all of the money is given directly to the mom of uh, the household. And so this is a program that check can it huge in Mexico, six million household, uh, but it's mostly a rural program. As I said, that's where I'm going to focus uh, attention today. How much are the benefits? On average, about $50 uh, a month. And this is, you know, it's a big increase in the income of these families on the order of about uh, 30%. The program is means tested. So all families in selected communities are interviewed or apply the socioeconomic survey. The eligibility is based on a poverty index, which uh, reflects income uh, and assets. Uh, you know, there have been evaluations of that. It's a very well-targeted uh, program. It's really pretty uh, good at uh, getting uh, the poorest of the poor in, into this program. 97% uh, of those offered accept. So after when households are determined to be eligible, they offer the program 97% accept. That's nice uh, also for uh, this evaluation because we don't have really the issue of people self-selecting into uh, program receipt. Okay, so here's a, here's a schedule of the, of the grants that are linked to these the education uh, grants. And so uh, there's a, this is amount, a US amount in US dollars. And so there's two features uh, that you can see from these grants. One, they go up with, uh, you know, with the grade. So this just reflects higher opportunity costs uh, of kids going to school as they, as they get older. Another aspect is that the grants are slightly higher, starting in secondary, not in primary, starting in secondary. And high school, the grants are slightly higher uh, for girls uh, than for boys. Now, why is this? So at the beginning of the program, this design feature, you know, what, where does this design feature come from? At the beginning, you know, it's observed in education trends that girls tended to drop out uh, at a higher rate than boys after primary school. So this was designed to, to compensate that. Although it actually turns out that you know, it's true that girls drop out uh, earlier after primary school, but uh, boys tend to fail more grades, so they take longer to complete the same amount of schooling. So in the net, you know, on total years of schooling, it's not, it's not clear that this was not, this was such a, a, a great idea or justified based on, you know, education uh, completion. All right. Okay, so what would we expect? Yeah? Sorry, I was going to ask, how much is the money trade? So do people actually get the money taken away from them? Yeah, so the teachers are the ones that report whether students are in school, and that's forwarded to the Yeah, I don't know. <coughs> so 
Uh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so what do we expect? Uh, so we expect, you know, I'm going to differ between what we expect in the short run versus the long run. So in the short run, uh, so these are, you know, this is subsizing school. It's getting money to go to school. So we expect to see uh, schooling uh, go up in the short run and work go down. So that, you know, exactly what the idea of the program is parents should, you know, stop having their kids work and spend, have them spend more time in school. And so that's what we expect in the short run. I shift away towards uh, from work towards school. Uh, in the longer run, you know, so what's going to happen is kids accumulate uh, more schooling. So eventually, you know, when they finish schooling, they should have a higher education than what they would have. This will make them more attractive in the labor market. And so what we expect is that would increase work eventually and uh, their wages. We also might expect to see the shifting from agricultural work to non-agricultural work as returns to schooling tend to be higher in non-agricultural um, jobs. Did you look at fertility? You didn't yeah, we did. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, because it's, uh, I was just wondering about the girls' so-called that's right. effect, yeah. and they could be through higher child quality. That's correct. Yeah. So we do actually do see a, a reduction. So yeah, they're in their mid-20s, so it's not final fertility, but completed. But but um, yeah, so. Okay, so there's a very large literature on effects of conditional cash transfers. I'm just going to say, um, uh, just talk briefly about the, the effects on uh, education. Um, you know, and I have a, this is my publicity uh, report coming, a uh, uh, paper that summarizes all the effects in, in other areas. Uh, so there's, you know, there's, so Mexico's also had a lot of influence on other countries uh, carrying out or starting CCTs because we had this. A famous early experimental evaluation where um, 506 communities were randomly assigned uh, between treated um, and uh, control groups. And so there are many short-term, there are many studies of short-term effects. They use this, uh, you know, experimental evaluation. The experiment didn't last very long. Uh, you know, we always want to put experiments to last as long as I can, but they don't usually last that long. The control groups started to receive benefits after a year and a half. So what did these short-term uh, studies find. Uh, they found uh, you know, basically positive effects on uh, schooling uh, indicators, on enrollment, uh, reducing dropout, increasing years of completed schooling, and importantly for our study, the largest schooling effects are on the transition from primary uh, to, to secondary. So it's actually, this is what we'll, we'll take uh, advantage of in the, in the paper. Okay, so just to give an idea of this, this is from the first year of the program, and so this is the, from the experimental data for the treatment and control, and so this shows the proportion of kids enrolled uh, by, by age right before the program uh, started, and so you can see, you can't distinguish even the control and treatment, uh, so that they're, um, they're identical. And so this is six months post-program, uh, and so what you see is, uh, so you, know, you can see for girls, this uh, gap between treatment and control, and so there's immediately a uh, you know, distinction where enrollment for girls right at this, you know, this age of entering secondary school goes up and it's sort of smaller at age 16 and, and above. And you can see this also for the, for the boys over there. And so this difference, this initial difference, in fact, continues to grow over time. And that's what we'll uh, use here. Okay, so there's a lot of other studies of uh, now CSER. Yeah, since there's so many, now there are also many other studies. Uh, these are a couple of... Um, uh, review pieces that summarize uh, schooling effects of CCTs in other, uh, in other countries. Here are a few that cite this mixed evidence on learning that I, that I mentioned earlier. Um, this paper is really the closest to ours uh, on Nicaragua, and this was a, you know, this was a pilot that did something a little uh, unusual, but there was a treatment group that received a CCT for three years, then stopped. <laughs> Then the control group received the CCT three years and it stopped. <laughs> then 10 years later, they compared <laughs> the, the two groups and they found some, um, some labor market effects. Uh, so this is really kind of the closest uh, to ours in terms of, uh, of uh, objectives. Okay, so uh, a little more background. So the program operates in 95,000 uh, rural communities. These are mostly located in what are called high poverty municipalities. Actually, there's an official definition in Mexico for poverty in a municipality, and it ranges it's called the margination index. When you say the marginación, and this rank, ranks them from high poverty all the way down to very, from very high poverty all the way down 
to very low poverty. And so the programs started in municipalities that were very high or high uh, poverty rates, and that's where I'll focus the impact uh, results. Okay, and as I was saying, by 2010, they're all uh, treated. Okay, so this just shows uh, just aggregate, uh, you know, increase in the proportion of beneficiary households uh, over time. Okay, so again, yeah, just to summarize, so the, the timeline of the program, so 1990, I'll use to show uh, that the identification uh, is okay. Uh, 1997, when the program begins, so my treatment group, my age treatment group, are kids 11 to 12, pre-program. I'll compare them to kids that are 15 to 16 who are just a little bit too old to benefit really from the education grants. I'll look at short-term effects in 2000. And then 2010, longer term effects. And then my treatment group, the kids will be white adults, 24 to 25, and I'll compare them to 28 to 29 year olds. Okay, I'm gonna ask How do you handle this. internal migration? Yeah, I'll, I'll get to that. Okay, okay. So, um, all right, so here's the. The specification then, the difference in difference. So the main uh, coefficient of interest is C, which is the, the program impact. And so this is the interaction between uh, P. So P uh, measures whether your municipality entered the program early or late. And how do I measure that? By the proportion of households that receive the program in the first two years of the program. Okay, so that'll be my measure of early uh, versus late. And that's interacted with the age of, of, of the youth. Okay. Um, so this says this is the, the program uh, impact. Uh, we also have municipal effects and we also cluster cluster at the, at the state level. Okay, uh, migration. So I have uh, two things to say. Oh, oh, you have a question? Yes, yeah, so just, just on the rollout, so the first difference is it wasn't randomized based on municipalities. The no. role that was based on from higher to lower poverty. That's correct. Right. So it's not in any way random. And so you know, the bad thing is that's why the, the different ages help me. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Um, so let me say there's two ways that uh, migration is important in the analysis. One, uh, what I want is I need to, I want to know where people lived pre programmed. Okay. So <laughs> in fact, the only reason that, though, that I can use the census is because there is, in fact, some information which allows me to approximate where they lived uh, pre-programmed. So in particular, the census asks about where you lived at the municipal level five years before, and it also asks about your state of birth. Okay, so I'm going to use that information. I could say more in detail, but uh, you know, if there are questions about that, I'll use that to construct their pre-programmed residents to link to whether they're in a municipality that received a program early uh, or not. Okay, so that's uh, that's. Uh, one way, uh, one aspect that migration is important here. The second aspect is who's in my sample. <laughs> and uh, in fact, yeah, the census has some information about who from the household migrates during, to the US during the past five years, uh, but they don't have any information on outcomes. Okay. So uh, my estimates of the impacts of the program only include uh, people who are in Mexico. So if you left for the US, so if you were you know, a kid who in 1997 you got the program for a couple of years and you migrated to the U.S. and you did come back, you are not in my sample in 2010. I can't say anything about what the program impacts are uh, for them. I do have all of the national migrants, right, because the census is represented, of, you know, it's the census of everybody who's within uh, Mexico. And so if you're, if you migrated within Mexico, you're in my sample. If you migrated out and did not return, uh, then you're not in my sample. How many, you know, this is a, clearly it's an age group, like has a lot of uh, uh, migration. How many people am I missing? Um, well, uh, in the census in 2010, uh, what I can see from the census is 4.5% of men in my sample migrated within the past uh, five years, 0.8% of women. So that gives some idea of how many um, I'm, I'm missing. Okay, so just a, a map of Mexico. This is just a, so, so this is the, a map by the Indice Marginacha, so by the municipality uh, poverty rate. So this goes from very high, so very high poverty all the way to low poverty. And so my sample is from those in high, very high, or high 
uh, poverty, poverty rates. And you can see that, you know, it's, there's basically all over the country except for Baja California, Baja California Norte. So, but, uh, it's, you know, it's mainly a sample that's uh, more uh, prevalent in the, the center and south, southern states. Okay, so here it's pretty, you know, it's such a diverse uh, population, it's pretty hard to generalize because picture typical family, lots of kids, very poor uh, housing quality. Okay, so let me start showing some, uh, uh, some, uh, some results. Okay, so this is this gives a picture of what uh, what these young adults uh, look like before the program starts. So this is uh, this is uh, 1990. So these are individuals uh, in their you know their mid 20s, uh, living in high poverty municipalities. And so you can see overall schooling is very low. So only about five years, unless in primary for men, for four uh, for women. Uh, labor force participation for men is very high. For women, it's really quite uh, quite low. Uh, sure. Yes. Is that uh, limited to formal employment? So you know, there's a couple of questions. So it's you know, they also ask not just whether you're working last week, but you know, did you sell things? So it tries to get at uh, some informal employment. It's not very, you know, certainly does not have. And this is a deficiency for sure. And the analysis doesn't have domestic work. It doesn't have unpaid agriculture work. It doesn't have a lot of information on agriculture work. Okay. So that's a, that's a, that's a. So I can't give a complete picture. Of what um, you know, kind of uh, uh, what people are doing for work. So that's that's correct. Okay. So um, and what else do I want to say? So it's also a population that uh, has a large proportion of indigenous. So about thirty-two uh, percent. This is measured by reporting speaking an indigenous uh, language. Okay. So yeah, the basic idea is a poor uh, population with not not very high levels of education. All right. Okay, so here's um, some of the, the tests of the identification. And so what is this? These are for each uh, indicator I'm reporting the difference in difference coefficient. So this is 1990. So this is a test of specification because we don't expect to see uh, effects. So if see program effects and there's something wrong uh, with the specification. So there, you know, overall there's, so there's 18 regressions here and there's significant differences in two of them. So that's, yeah, that's pretty good. That's uh, about what you expect, about 10% uh, by chance uh, being significant. So for women, none of these are, uh, are significant. Uh, diff there aren't significant differences. For men, there's one on earned income. And in fact, we'll see a, a bit of a strange result. This may uh, uh, reflect that uh, uh, later on. But overall, this is, uh, you know, this is pretty uh, uh, supportive of the identification strategy. Okay, this is, um, uh, this is using 2010 to look at different age groups, uh, so the effect on uh, education. So, you know, the story that I've been telling is basically that kids who are too old to get the program, you shouldn't see a program effect on schooling. And that's, you know, in this graph, which just says whether you have some secondary school, exactly what you see is that the proportion of households in the program doesn't uh, you know, it's, it's sort of constant, and you see this jump up uh, right at the age groups where uh, the hypothesis that it should, it should jump up. So this is also um, uh, supportive. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, great. So now uh, let me talk about uh, the impacts. Uh, so the way I will uh, talk about short-term and long-term impacts first for education, and then for labor uh, market effects for, uh, for males and uh, females. Okay, so these are the three-year effects starting in, um, so sorry, in 2000. And so here I have grades of schooling, and then this is more than primary, more than secondary, more than, uh, more than, more than high school. And so what we see actually, the short-term effects, this is, will be different uh, for, for women, but for men we don't see, you know, this coefficient is kind of the right sign and about the right, uh, you know, size, uh, it's not, it's not statistically uh, significant. And so why, you know, so it seems to be, you know, by 2010, we see large significant effects of schooling of 0.65. So why don't we see these short-term short effects initially? And this, I think, goes back to what I said earlier, that it takes longer for, for boys to accumulate uh, 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 additional schooling. Uh, than girls because of these uh, high failure rates. And we can do more on that by looking at enrollment and, and other educational effects. 
Okay. All right, so what happens by 2010? Uh, we have an increase in completed schooling. I always uh, call it grades uh, because it's you know completed grades. So this uh, you know, abstracts a bit from whether you you failed or repeated a grade. But so you have as a result of the program 0.65 uh, more years of schooling than you would have had uh, without. Uh, here we can see that that increase in schooling. Where does that come from? That's really concentrated. And so this shows the probability of having more than primary school, so that's seven percentage increase. The effect is really concentrated on secondary school. So this is not a program that gets uh, kids, you know, into college huh? or even high school. It's, uh, the kids get some more secondary school, and that's uh, and that's about it. All right. Okay. So what happens uh, for uh, for girls? And so for girls, we see the education effects accumulate early, earlier on. Uh, so by uh, 2000, so the effect of, on grades of schooling completed is at uh, 0.9. Again, that's largely concentrated in secondary school. So this increase in schooling uh, that kids are attaining is uh, through additional time, additional years in secondary school. So what happens in 2010? Uh, not much more of an increase, so the overall increase by this time their girls are women in their, um, their mid-20s, uh, and so they have uh, an overall increase of about one grade of scoring. And again, concentrated on um, uh, increase in secondary, so this represents a 12.6 increase in the probability of having uh, more than primary, uh, primary scoring. Okay, uh, so now, so we've established that there's uh, a significant increase in completed schooling, what happens uh, in the labor market. And so in 2000, let's look uh, what happens in the short run. So in the short run, we see a reduction uh, for, for males in the probability of working, a reduction in hours work. This is exactly what we should see. So this is exactly the time that kids should be spending more time in school and less time working uh, in the short run right after they start receiving um, uh, the program. In fact, and we also say, so this is the proportion agriculture, this is unconditional. So what that tells us is most of this reduction of working is kids reducing uh, agricultural type uh, employment. Okay. You know, there's this, you know, this barely significant <laughs> coefficient on labor income, which actually we saw in the 1990 uh, pre-program trend. So I'm, you know, it, I'm not going to pay too, uh, too, too much attention to that right now, although that's something that uh, we're still uh, looking, looking at. Okay. okay, so what happens in 2010? So now when uh, the males are in their mid-20s, uh, mid so now before we saw a reduction in working, uh, now we see an increase. This is where they've achieved about 0.7 grades of schooling, an increase in the probability of participating. The means, by the way, are here. Okay, so this is an increase of four percentage points in the probability of working. This is up from a base of 83%. Uh, percent. Uh, we see an increase as well in hours, uh, as hours worked. Um, this is weekly. Uh, labor income, so this is an increase of, oh, sorry, this is in, in pesos of about 700 uh, pesos uh, this is monthly compared to a mean of uh, 1,800, so that's a very large increase, about uh, 30, uh, 35 percent. And as we were seeing uh, before, uh, we see a reduction in participation in agriculture work, so shifting towards non-agricultural uh, jobs. Okay, we did look uh, kind of initially at, uh, it's also an area where we're still looking at marriage. Actually, you know, the census doesn't have uh, children, doesn't ask about children more for uh, for men, but um, uh, anyway, okay. <coughs> yes. So I actually have a question on the previous slide. Sure. Um, so it looks like when you get to secondary school, you should also see when it comes to the number of the amount of grants received by the family. So it looks like not many families are receiving sort of this conditional transfer for to keep kids in secondary and high school, right? Because you don't see. Because I was wondering if this is only a compliance issue, or is it, or you can see it actually the number of plans for the kids in high school. Right. No. So here, this is just the coefficient 
on sort of the whether you, you're in a municipality that gets the program earlier versus your age. So it's comparing younger youth who were offered the grants as they were in their secondary, so younger youth to older youth. year. So what happens in the short run? So here in the short run, we don't see a lot of reduction in uh, work of um, females in the short run. You know, on the other hand, uh, you know, labor force participation rates of girls were only 18 percent uh, in 2000, so it's very sort of low uh, labor force. This partly reflects the type of work that's uh, measured. In, uh, in the census. You know, you do see this, you know, this is sort of marriage at, um, you know, at these, uh, these young ages. Uh, so um, in, the, in the short run, so this just could, you know, mean not necessarily they won't get married in the long run, but postponing of marriage. And then, you know, kind of this negative is called, you know, be nice if this program reduced adolescent childbearing, uh, which is a big problem in Mexico. Um, but anyway, this is not statistically significant. What happens in 2010, where women are in their mid-20s, uh, they've achieved uh, an additional grade of schooling compared to what they would have achieved without the program. And you know, the answer is not a lot in the labor market. So no effect on the probability of working. And this is you know, pretty striking given how low you know, the labor force participation rate, even for this type of work, is. It's very low in these communities, and the program doesn't increase it, so no, no effects on labor income or hours worked. So really, this, uh, so these don't show changes. It's as if uh, the women didn't receive uh, this additional year so or didn't participate uh, in, in the program. So again, we have this uh, you know, initial analysis looking at uh, marriage and children. Well, yeah, this is interesting uh, reduction in number of Children born again. This is, you know, this is fertility in their mid twenties, and so they haven't, uh, by any chance, completed fertility. This would be a very large effect if it were completed, but it probably represents mostly postponing uh, having children. You know, we have to wait till later uh, to see. But uh, anyway, that's uh, kind of demographic and family effects. I think will be very interesting as well. So, isn't those are those cohorts compared at the same age though? The reduction. So it's, so it's comparing young to old in... Um, but it's not comparing children that were born by age 24 versus 28. It, it is carrying out that difference, but it's differencing between municipalities that get the program okay, okay, earlier. Okay, so it's, 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 it's the age age. differences differs yeah. out. Okay, yeah. yeah. Sort of, but we should sort of properly use a proportional model, right? Yeah. 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 That is. That's the number of people <coughs> different. That's, right. that's sort of on the list. It's a different yeah. Yeah. curve of combat. Yeah. 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 So yeah, it's a bit tantalizing, but it's yeah, it's pretty. Uh, okay, all right. So I'm going to uh, summarize. Then so uh, you know this uh, work is look at uh, rural areas on the impacts where Progressa has been operating the longest uh, uh, time in Mexico, and so we're seeing uh, improvements in completed schooling, which are now showing some significant labor market effects. Uh, for men. So for men, the effects are pretty large. Uh, so not just in schooling, but in terms of increasing labor force participation for a group that already worked a lot, uh, measured by uh, this, uh, the way that work is measured. In the census, labor market earnings are 35% higher. Uh, so this reflects both increases in work and higher earnings per hour, and also uh, more, uh, more hours worked. And you see, and additionally, a shift towards not agricultural work, you know, and in fact we have a lot more, the sense is pretty good about measuring occupation and, um, you know, sector, and so we can do kind of a lot more on, you know, what type of jobs, you know, what exactly are, um, are they doing, and that's, uh, uh, which we'll look at uh, later. Uh, for women, you know, it's more of a, a mixed uh, story, so the impacts on education are even higher uh, for women uh, than uh, for men, yet uh, only a small proportion of women work 
in uh, the market, and progressive doesn't seem to affect the proportion in spite of uh, the pretty large uh, education effects. So these effects of increasing schooling by a year, you know, compared to what they would have had without the browser, an increase of about 15%. Now that's a big jump in uh, completed schooling. We're not seeing, uh, at least up till now, uh, evidence that this has an effect in the labor market. And I'll just close with a caveat that, of course, the census only provides, does not provide data on domestic work or on unpaid agricultural type work, basically on overall agricultural um, unpaid jobs, such as taking care of animals, which women uh, tend to do more. So thank you.